we're going to start a new series this morning uh, that I'm calling Resurrection Stories. So on Easter Sunday, we celebrate the resurrection. Jesus was raised from the dead, and we celebrate that, but then there was 40 days between Jesus' resurrection and his ascension where he uh, revealed himself and, and appeared and taught about the kingdom of God uh, to the disciples. And so we're going to look at some of those themes where Jesus shows up uh, because part of this is coming from even just my own story, uh, is that um, the resurrection stories, we're going to talk about how hope meets us where we are. How hope finds us and meets us where we are. Have you ever felt like life has just sort of like all these circumstances that have like conspired to assault your hope? Have you ever felt like maybe, and you don't want to say this in church because it doesn't sound very spiritual, but you ever felt like maybe you're losing hope? Or it's at least just hanging by a thread? Have you ever felt like things just, this is not how it's supposed to be. You're just in a season of life and you just have this, this, this phrase in your head, this is not how it's supposed to be. And sometimes it doesn't take much for that thought to come into our minds. It sometimes could be a little bit. I remember uh, there have been a couple different times where I tried my hand at, uh, at baking and I mixed up, you know, just putting in a little too much salt, like a tablespoon instead of a teaspoon or the baking soda. And when the cookie or whatever you bake comes out, you can really, t- it was just a little bit, but it really made it to where you took a bite. It's like, this is not how it's supposed to be. Sometimes it feels like life is like that, you know? It's like, it's not that, sometimes it's not something that we feel like should be a big deal, but it's enough that it just makes life feel like this is not how it's supposed to be. In Luke chapter 24, we'll be reading from there in a few moments, but we're going to meet two disciples who are in that place, saying to themselves, this is not how it was supposed to be. These two disciples are really on the verge of losing hope. Uh, Everything they had hoped, literally, their, their hopes, their dreams, their ideas of what the future would look like, they literally died two days before the moment we're going to enter into with them. Earlier in the chapter, early in Luke 24, before we meet these two disciples, um, some women had went to the temple. This is what we talked about on Easter. Women, or not the temple, the tomb. The women went to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body with spices, but they found the stone rolled away, there was no body there, and there were these messenger angels who said, hey, he's risen from the dead. And so they go back and they tell the apostles, the other disciples, hey, he's risen but they don't believe them. They think they're delusional. Perhaps it was a hallucination. I mean, it's been a really rough couple of days, a lot of emotion, a lot of trauma, a lot of grief. Maybe you imagine that you saw angels. But Peter, and then John's Gospel lets us know that John went to, and John also has to tell us that he beat Peter there as it was a race. But um, John's funny like that, I guess. But they go to the tomb, and they find it, sure enough, Stone rolled away, and there's no body. There's just one problem. Um, There's also no Jesus. Like, Jesus was in my head. You ever felt like that? Like, Jesus is just missing in action? Like, there's rumors. Like, people are talking about this resurrection hope and how God is on the move doing things in the world. It just seems like... It's not showing up in your life, though. Like, Jesus, where's Jesus in my story? They go to the tomb, and there's no body, but there's also no Jesus. And so these two disciples that we're going to meet, uh, they're leaving Jerusalem. They're walking away from Jerusalem, heading to this place called Emmaus. Um, and that's where we enter into the story. There's rumors that Jesus is risen, but there's also no Jesus. And so we're going to follow up or or enter into the story there in Luke's Gospel if you have Bibles or devices or if you just want to listen along, I invite you to to do that as well. Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, we're going to begin in verse 13, and I'm reading from the uh, NIV, sometimes I read from the NLT, sometimes the NIV, Wednesdays I'll switch it up on you and I will pick another version, but Luke, chapter 24, verse 13. Now that same day, so this is the same day that the women went to the tomb, that same day, two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. 
as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. And one of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. Cracks me up a little bit, Jesus, as I claim that. What, what things? About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. Listen to this. Here it is. But we had hoped. Lost of hope. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. What is more, this is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken to. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on, I love this too, as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while we talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Then they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. And there they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true the Lord is risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way, and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. So, these two disciples, they are walking along the road to Emmaus. And as they're walking along, they can't help but be reminded of how far the reality is that they're experiencing, how far it is from everything they had hoped. You see, they're walking to this village called Emmaus. Emmaus was sort of like a historical landmark, like Selma or Gettysburg or even Pearl Harbor would be for us. See, there was a great battle won about two centuries before this at Emmaus. It was during the time when Judea was a tributary state under the rule of Antiochus Epiphanes. I've actually told you about him before. Antiochus Epiphanes was essentially attempting to wipe out the cultural memory of the Jews. He, he outlawed all these festivities and rituals and practices, all these things that were sort of part of their identity as a people. He outlawed these things. Then the last straw came when he took the temple at Jerusalem that was dedicated to worship of Yahweh, and he made it a place to worship the Greek god Zeus. And then he sacrificed an unclean pig on the altar. I mean, just highly offensive to the Jewish people. Well, one day, there was a Greek official in the temple there to uh, enforce worship of Zeus, and there was a high priest by the name of Mattathias, and Mattathias refused. But then when his fellow countryman, another Jew, stepped forward to comply, Mattathias struck him down, and then he killed the Greek official too, and then he fled from Jerusalem to the hillside with his five sons. One of his sons, by the name of Judah, uh, who would later become known as Judah Maccabeus, which means the hammer, Judah the hammer, became uh, the leader of this small band of militia after his dad, Mattathias, died. And this small uh, militia became a rebel army, and they uh, did guerrilla warfare against the Seleucids to try to liberate the Jewish people. Well, this uh, small militia, under the leadership of Judah the Hammer, there's a turning point in their, in their cause 
when Judah led a surprise attack against some generals and soldiers who were camped at Emmaus in 166 B.C. And they actually, uh, the Greeks retreated. They retreated from Emmaus and the, the Maccabees were victorious. It would take a couple of years, but the Maccabees eventually drove their enemies out of Jerusalem. And on December 25th of 164 B.C., Judah Maccabeus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey while people were waving palm branches and shouting Hosanna, and he went into the temple and cleansed it of all the pagan artifacts and rededicated it to Yahweh. This event is still celebrated today, and it's known as Hanukkah. So it was when the Maccabees drove the Greeks out of Jerusalem, and that was the beginning. Uh, that reclaiming of Jerusalem marked the beginning of of the Jewish liberation, and it would eventually result in the Hasmonean dynasty that would rule from 142 to 63 B.C. until the Romans, you know, the, the juggernaut of Rome came into the picture, and then they would fall under Roman authority again. That, that is what the Jews had in mind when they heard talk about the kingdom of God is here. And when they heard talk about there's this guy and he, he might be the Messiah, what they had in mind is someone like Judah the Hammer, who would come in and liberate Israel from Rome. And even just a week ago, he had rode in on a donkey, just like Judah Maccabeus. He shouts of Hosanna and he cleansed the temple and, and the religious leaders don't really like him, but he's the Messiah. He was supposed to lead them in a rebellion against Rome, not get killed by the Romans. And so, Friday, Friday was one of the most disillusioning, disappointing days in their lifetime when Jesus was crucified. Everything they believed about God, everything they believed about their identity, their country, everything they believed about the scriptures and the Messiah. Like, this is their faith, this is their country, this is their identity. It's everything. Everything was disappointing. Everything was flipped upside down when Jesus was crucified on that cross. So, these two disciples, one of them, we told his name is Cleopas, they're walking away from Jerusalem. And they're heading to Emmaus, talking about all these things that have happened. And I think sometimes that is where we find ourselves too. On our own roads to Emmaus. Walking away from the last heartbreaking letdown that we had come through. Maybe you hear this morning and you're just tired of pursuing temporary things. Maybe you've lost hope of ever overcoming that addiction. Maybe you've lost hope that your marriage could ever really be healthy again. Maybe you've, maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe you're walking through a season and maybe you've not lost your job, but it's not looking real secure. Maybe you're single and you've just sort of lost hope that you would ever really find companionship. And the truth is, is you don't tell people, but the truth is, is you feel really alone. Maybe you're on your own road to Emmaus. You have hope. But you're walking away from that last letdown. You're walking away from everything you had hoped. I have good news for you this morning. Jesus has a habit of meeting people who are on the road. He actually, I think, likes to find his disciples in that place. And he them. Because that's what we're told. Jesus himself, they're walking to Emmaus, and all of a sudden, seemingly out of nowhere, Jesus himself shows up and he starts walking with them. He just sort of inserts himself into their conversation. Which maybe is kind of rude. I don't know. He wasn't invited, but um, he just pops in. They don't recognize him. They don't realize it's Jesus. His resurrected body. It's a physical body. We see that Jesus eats. He interacts, but it also seems to be different because he can appear or disappear. There's a point where he, he shows up in a, a locked. There's a room that was locked, and he appears there. So this resurrected body is a glorified body. But so he appears seemingly out of nowhere, and I love this. It seems like Jesus is being a little playful. I don't know, maybe it's how I read it, but he's just like, hey, what are you guys talking about? And then they stop, just dead in their tracks. And the grief, the sadness, the disappointment, I mean, it's written all over their faces. And they look at Jesus and they say, are you the only one all in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's happening? Like, do you 
live under a rock, Jesus, is what you're saying. And, and I, again, he's, what things? I think Jesus is being playful, but I also think there's something beautiful here. Jesus doesn't come up beside these disciples who are on the road to Emmaus and begin offering answers, even though he is the answer. He enters in, and he assumes the posture of, of asking and allowing them to share their disappointment and their disillusionment, allowing them to tell him about what's going on. So they do. They tell him about this Jesus of Nazareth, this prophet who is mighty in word and deed, but who the religious leaders were threatened by, and so they collaborated with the Romans and they sentenced him to death, and he was crucified. But we had hoped, we had hoped he would be the one who would liberate Israel. But it also gets a little weird because the women went to the tomb this morning and they said they saw angels and his body wasn't there. But the thing is, a missing body doesn't mean resurrection. Like, Jesus wasn't there either. And so they're kind of just wrestling with this. And, and you know, maybe something sinister is going on. Maybe someone stole his body. Maybe there's a conspiracy. Maybe they're trying to further discredit Jesus' uh, ministry. We don't know what's happening. It's just we had hoped. And then Jesus rebukes them. He says how foolish they are for being slow to believe. And I think sometimes we read... And we, we read Jesus' rebuke, and, and I don't know about you, but I used to read it, and, and I would hear his rebuke harshly. But one of the fruit of the Spirit, or, or the list in the fruit of the Spirit, is gentleness. And Paul says in another place that we're to speak the truth in love. In Scripture, John says that Jesus is full of grace and truth. So if anyone is able to speak the truth in love and be full of grace and truth and to rebuke in gentleness, it's Jesus. I think Jesus always rebukes with gentleness. It's always, you always know it's coming from a heart of love. He tells them, they're slow to believe everything that was written about himself. And then he begins to open up to them. He explains everything from Moses to the prophets about what the scriptures had said about himself. And then Jesus gets playful again. Luke tells us he acted essentially as if he was going to walk on. He just pretends like he's going to go on after they get to Emmaus. And the disciples say, no, no, stay with us, stay. And so he, he agrees and he stays and they go in at the table. And what's interesting is Jesus is a guest, but he assumes the place of host. He takes the bread and he gives thanks for it. And he breaks it and he gives it to them. And it is at that moment, at the table. The table, the place where Jesus' disciples were so familiar with before. That place where Jesus had sat with tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes and the marginalized and the pagan and the Gentile. It was at the table that their eyes were opened and they recognized Jesus. And then he vanishes, which would be a little disappointing, I'll be honest. You're like, oh, he's Jesus. Oh, God. Like, but they're like, but it was him. And so they get so excited that they run all the way. I'm assuming they ran because it was late. We're told it was late in the day. And it was seven miles back to Jerusalem. So they head all the way back to Jerusalem. They find the other disciples. They say, he's alive. And they're like, yeah, we know. He revealed himself to Simon. And, and he was recognized at the table and the breaking of bread. They tell him everything that happened. And it's just this beautiful picture of how Jesus, how hope finds us. Hope finds us where we are. This morning... Maybe you are on your own road to Emmaus. Maybe you have that sense that this is not how it was supposed to be, or you have that feeling of, I had hoped. I had hoped it was going to be different. I had hoped it would look differently, it would play out differently, that there would be a, just a different, you know, happy ending, that, that, that it would look differently. You're, you're in that place. I want to share with you this morning three just sort of insights from this story in Luke 24. And I believe, not because, not because I'm saying them, but I believe the Holy Spirit can work in a way in these insights to potentially uh, reinvigorate your hope and even transform your life. So I want to talk to you first about perspective and presence. Perspective and presence. Um, I think it's a hard truth to accept. At least it is for me. Um, 
But I think sometimes it could be that we've lost hope because we've misplaced our hope in something other than Jesus. These disciples have lost hope because what they expected and, and what actually happened were miles apart. And it's in that space, it's in that gap between what we expect and what actually happens. It's in that gap where we lose hope. But, but what they expected was for the Messiah to do what they wanted. They, they essentially expected God to work through the, through the Messiah according to their agenda, not according to God's. And so they had put their hope in what Jesus would do, not in who he was. They had misplaced their hope. I think sometimes we can do that too. It, it, we, we lose hope because we put it in something else other than the person of Jesus. I think also it's true, and, and it's just helpful to have this reminder, our perspective. It's also true that sometimes our disillusionment and our disappointment can inhibit our ability to see the activity and working and movement and presence of God in the lives. But sometimes we can be so consumed with how disappointed we are that we do not see God's presence and, and how he's working in our life. And, and so we don't recognize him. Just like these disciples, they're on the way to, to Emmaus, and Jesus himself shows up, but it says they didn't recognize him. I think sometimes... We don't recognize, but just because we don't recognize God's presence, I just want to tell you, it doesn't mean he's not there. And I want to encourage you, too, it's okay if you don't recognize it. I think it's helpful to start trying to have the perspective where you're looking for it, but the beautiful thing is, is Jesus was still there. They didn't recognize it, but he was there. And so I guess I'm just encouraging you and, and by faith saying to you, listen, you may not recognize it, but he's possibly closer than you could ever imagine. Sometimes our disappointment, our disillusionment, our discouragement, our despair, sometimes I think it, it obscures, hinders, and blocks our vision from seeing God's presence. But I just want to tell you, He is closer than you can ever imagine. When hope is lost, Jesus is there with you, even if you don't recognize we may be feeling sometimes, I don't know if you felt this way, but like those disciples said, Jesus, are you the, do you live under a rock? Are you the only one who doesn't know what happened in Jerusalem? I think sometimes I felt like that. God, do you, like, do you remember that I'm bound by time? Do you remember that I'm human? Do you understand? Do you remember, God, are you the only one who doesn't know what's going on? I want to tell you, in that moment on Emmaus and in your moment on your own Emmaus Road, he is the only one who actually does know what's going on. Jesus intimately knows what's going on in your life and your story. And the thing is, is he cares. Because here's another beautiful perspective. The nature of Jesus' death and resurrection and the redemptive plan that God was unfolding, it was so much bigger than these two disciples who were walking to Emmaus. What was happening, what's going on here is bigger than you. It's bigger than us. Our lives in the scope of history, our, our world in the scope of the galaxy and the universe is so small. And I don't say that so you feel insignificant. I want to point out what was happening was so much bigger than those two disciples, yet Jesus shows up there. He takes the time to find them there in the road to Mace. What's going on here is so much bigger than you, and even in the midst of that, Jesus still wants to meet you where you are. He still has a habit of finding disciples on the road to Emmaus. Darren Whitehead, in his book, Rumors of God, writes, Why bother with two cynics who are walking away? Because of love. Jesus is compelled by love. He still leaves the 99 to find the one. Jesus believes that despair is not the final word. Jesus' love propels him to rescue us from our smaller stories and reunite us to his. Because for the one who came to seek and save the lost, hope is not a myth. The story of the scriptures is the story of Jesus. Hope is not concerning our circumstances. Hope is concerning Jesus. 
there's so much more going on here than what you are experiencing, yet God intimately cares about your story and wants to enter into your story. Why? Because he loves you. He loves you. So when we are on our roads to Emmaus, our perspectives are usually not complete. So we need to trust in God's presence. So just be aware, if you're in that place of struggling to hope, I'm not telling you to try to fix your perspective because sometimes the truth is, is it's not within our capacity. Like there are moments, depending on what's going on in our lives, maybe not for you, but for me, there are moments where I just didn't have the capacity. I didn't have it. So when people tell you, well, just have a better perspective, have faith, hope, then it's like, well, it's not there. Like I can try, but but it's there's something in me is empty. And so if you're you're in that place, I just want you to be aware though. You can be aware, okay, my perspective probably isn't fully accurate, and, and what I can do is just trust in God's presence. And then, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but there's also times where people come in and they sort of help support us, where we don't have the capacity to make you, and that's one of the beautiful things about the church. But that's point number three, by the way. So let's go to number two. So pers- uh, perspective and presence. Number two, I want to talk about persistence in faith. So hold on to this with, with whatever you can, and if you you don't feel like you have enough faith, God's really good at working with what we do have, and then allow people to surround you. But you may say, I don't see him. I don't recognize him. That's where we can persist in faith. When we don't, when we don't see Jesus clearly in the moment, hold on to what you already know is true about him. So these disciples talk about Jesus, and they say, He's powerful in word and deed. They had probably saw him raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out demons, command authority over nature and calm storms and all this stuff. They knew that was true about him because they had probably seen some of it happen with their own eyes. And so when you are on the road to a and you don't recognize him there, remember what he has done in the past. Remember what you already know is true about Jesus. Remember how he has already been faithful. When, when we don't recognize him in the present, we can persist in holding on to the faith of, well, I know this is true about Jesus. And it seems like Jesus is missing in action and nowhere to be found. Rehearse, remember who he is and what he has done, and then hold on to this. Whatever faith you can, hold on to this. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. By faith, cling to and persist in the hope that Jesus is closer than you think. He is right here. He's right here. And then lastly, I want to talk to you about people and scriptures. People and scriptures. There's transformative hope to be found in the midst of people and in the scriptures. Luke mentions twice that Jesus was recognized, that they, they realized it was him at the table at the breaking of bread. It's, it's at the table in the midst of the gathered community that Jesus was recognized. The, the table, the place where they broke bread, it would call to mind the Last Supper in the practice that we now do known as communion, that place where we remember Jesus was death and resurrection, that his body was broken for us, and his blood was shed for us. That would, that would be the thing that would shape the people of God. But it also, the term breaking of bread was also sort of shorthand, symbolic shorthand for the gathered community. Listen to Acts chapter 2, verses 44 through 47. It says, All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They broke bread together around the table. It's sort of symbolic for the gathered community. So when our hope is on life support, it is often in the midst of the gathered community that we will recognize Jesus. You see, we are supposed to reflect God. We are supposed to reflect Jesus to the world out there, but also the one in us. 
that, that we are to reflect Jesus and his love and his work in the world is to turn hands and feet. We are, we are meant to be the activity of God in the world. And we do this when we provide a meal for people. We do this when we visit people who are stuttering. We do this when we send cards. We do this when uh, I was part of a small group that helped a young couple. They, they bought the materials, but our small group helped with the labor of replacing the roof. I've been part of, uh, there's a group here who pulled their money together and helped buy a washer and dryer set for, for someone in our church. We, we, we've been part of different small groups for helping people move, you know, unpacking a home, showing up in those ways. I've been part of times where people just got a cup of coffee with someone because they just needed someone to listen. When we do those things, we, we, we as the gathered community are reflecting Jesus to one another. And that's, that's what we're doing here. We don't gather so that, like, this institution known as LifePoint can thrive. We gather, on Sunday mornings, we gather as a, as a community around worship in the Word because we believe these, these songs, these anthems of praise actually shape us, that, that, that there's potential for it to reorient our posture. And I don't know about you, but I got a little off track during the week. It takes about five minutes of my kids pushing the right button before... Uh, you know, we're a little, little bit off track of where we should be as, as a Jesus follower. So we gather and we sing these songs that worship God and praise God and that shapes us. And then we hear the word proclaimed and hopefully God, not because of who's proclaiming it, because the Spirit inhabits the praise of His people and, and He speaks through His word. We believe this shapes us so that we can then go from here and be salt and light so we can be agents of healing and hope wherever we go. And so what we're doing here is not about like 10 a.m. at 1006 South 16th Street. What we're doing is trying to be a people who are shaped by the DNA of heaven. And then help one another be agents of hope and healing to one another and to people. Because it's at the table. The breaking of bread the two or three are gathered, that for some reason, at least in this text, that's when Jesus is recognized. There is something that the world will recognize and that we can recognize him in one another when we do this thing right. So people, but then also the scriptures. So Jesus explained the scriptures to them. He opened the scriptures. And so it is important for this for you to immerse yourself in this, and, and I think it's important to do as an individual. More than any other time in history, this is really accessible. Uh, my phone's in the pew, but there are apps, the YouVersion Bible app with reading plans. There are audio versions. I have a friend who works at a factory and is able to put headphones in, and he listens to the scripture there. This, this is one of the ways that we recognize Jesus. This is one of the ways that we see him. But I also want to point out something, too. I think sometimes people get overconfident in their ability to interpret this in isolation. And, and you know, everything they read and then they interpret, well, it, it must be true. But these disciples, they knew the scriptures. They knew the Hebrew scriptures. They probably had more of it memorized than you or I will ever have in our lifetime. But it says Jesus explained it. And that word in the Greek, it carries the idea of translating it in someone's native tongue. And it, it's not literally. They, it was translated. He, he sort of unlocked and revealed things, and he did it with two disciples. There were two or three gathered. There's something about, yes, immerse yourself in this on your own. But also, this, when we open this together, when we learn from one another's perspectives, when our stories with this illuminate meaning, Jesus Jesus is found in the scriptures, but it's not meant to be in isolation from the community. It's people and scripture. The gathered community and the word. Jesus is recognized in those times. So maybe you're here, and you're on your own road to Emmaus. You had hope. I want to tell you, Jesus wants to meet you there on that road to Emmaus. He's really good at it. And it's his delight to show up there. You think maybe you're walking away, but he's able to find you. If you want to 
to try to look for him too. Just want to encourage you to realize that your perspective might be off. And, he, and he's present. And you just have to persist in faith in that sometimes. But then I also want to encourage you to, to be connected to the gathered community where the scriptures are explained. I believe Jesus is showing up. 